wake up. It's the Sleep Unplugged Podcast, episode 117, Seasons of Sleep, as the old sun dies. Welcome everyone to the Sleep Unplugged Podcast. My name is Chris Winter. I'm a neurologist and sleep specialist and your host for this episode of the podcast. If you're new to the Sleep Unplugged family, welcome. If you're a veteran of the podcast, welcome back. We're so glad you're here. So if you are interested in communicating with the podcast, my social media is Dr. Chris Winter. That's Twitter, Dr. Chris Winter Instagram, Dr. Chris Winter TikTok. We have a YouTube page where we post all the video content of our show. We also have a Spotify playlist where we talk about the music discussed at the top of each episode. Great feedback from last week's episode about Andrew Spector's book, Navigating Life with Restless Leg Syndrome. I've always suspected that there is a big restless leg population out there that wants more information, wants more treatment options. And I think Andrew's book really delivers. So I hope you enjoyed that episode of the podcast. If you're somebody who struggles with restless leg, like I do, that you are finding some great help in that book. So we always talk, start the show off with comments, corrections, criticisms. This came from the YouTube page, the Sleep and Plug YouTube page, where uh, an individual wrote, my partner uh, does this and we just go with the flow. This was on the episode we um, uh, mentioned about this, th that we did about sex somnia. Uh, it's been a while back that we did that. I don't remember right off the bat what episode the sexomnia um, one was, but she wrote, hey, um, the sex is actually quite good and he has given his consent for me to go along with it. So he's the one that um, is sort of out of it. She's the one that's basically saying, hey, you know, if 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 it's okay with you, it's okay with me. So he gave consent, which I think is really important. Uh, with this, uh, you know, it, some patients, as we talked in that sexomnia episode, uh, tend to want to be sort of uh, away from their partner. Uh, there's concerns, you know, about that. And so, uh, you know, kind of working these things out ahead of time, I think really, really makes a lot of, a uh, lot of sense. Um, and she wrote, uh, he's given my consent for me to go along with it, which is good because it's very difficult uh, to wake him up. But if it goes on too long, I do have to wake him up and kick him out of bed so I can sleep. Uh, so anyway, uh, I, I like the idea that you're creating conversation about this as I get ready to start working with NBA teams and, and kind of starting that process again. Every, every time I see football starting, I know that basketball is going to get going as well too soon. So it, it's nice to know that you know having those conversations about sexomnia coming up with some rules and, and and things of that nature can really be extremely helpful for people who are, are who are dealing with that. So um, the music that I chose for this week's episode, uh, there's a line called as the old sun dies, which I kind of think about as we're heading from summer to fall, I believe beginning of fall is September 22nd. So this will be the last episode of summer I like the idea of the sun, you know, dying and, and, and for some individuals, pe people thinking that sort of uh, is marking the, the end of, of summer. So as the sun dies and we move to fall, this song comes from one of my favorite songs uh, written by uh, Brian Eno and John Cale. It's called Spinning Away. And if you ever saw the Leonardo, Leonardo DiCaprio movie, The Beach, Sugar Ray actually covered this song and it's beautifully placed in the movie. But this was from a collaboration between Brian Eno, who we talked about on episode 40 because he was uh, one of the members of Roxy Music, who left Roxy Music and really had a career helping a lot of influential artists. He was instrumental in Bowie's Berlin Trilogy and even worked with U2 on their Unforgettable Fire album, Joshua Tree, Octung Baby, and All You, Can, uh, All you Can't Leave Behind, which was in 2000, I believe. And then he circled back and had a real 
big collaboration with you two on their No Line on the Horizon um, album. And if you want an off the beaten U2 song that has Brian Eno's name all over it, um, it's Your Blue Room, which they actually performed at a concert that I saw. And it was just absolutely magnificent with this screen behind you two of like a space, you know, floating around. It's fantastic. Um, John Kale, we've mentioned Lou Reed, uh, who was a founding member of Velvet Underground. Lou Reed was in episode 76. We actually mentioned Velvet Underground was one of the first musical groups we talked about back in episode 23. So it's only uh, only fair that we mentioned John Kale, who was also a founding member of Velvet Underground. So John Kale, Lou Reed, Velvet Underground, Andy Warhol, The Factory, Chelsea Hotel. I'm going to say how many times I can mention Chelsea Hotel now in future episodes, because we've been doing it now for about five or six episodes straight. So basically, they all got together and recorded the first Velvet Underground song, sorry, first Velvet Underground album. And we're trying to find somebody who would buy it and somebody who would put it out there. And so it was getting passed around to all these influential artists who loved it, even though VU couldn't get a record deal. Um, and actually one of the songs on that first album, I'm Waiting for the Man, David Bowie heard and recorded before VU ever got their album out there. So Velvet Underground were only together, I believe, from 64 to 68. And then everybody kind of went their separate ways. And everybody knows about Lou, Re Lou Reed's successful career. We talked about that in episode 76. But John Cale had a very interesting musical career as well, too. Did some interesting soundtracks. And he did this collaboration with Brian Eno. One album It's called Wrong Way Up. I believe it was released in 1995, if I recall. Uh, I kind of remember it being towards the end of my um undergraduate career and this song spinning away which is if you listen to the words and read the lyrics is a poem about an artist probably vincent van gogh painting starry night and the idea if you look at starry night there's an i there's a sense of motion and spinning in it and it's just an absolute delightful song and it's 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 sheer poetry if you read the lines and so um, and it was so good that episode that this season's uh, season three of the bear featured it in one of their uh, episodes. And it was just awesome. It's just such a great song. So hats off to John Cale. Uh, I guess we'll, we'll talk about uh, Nico at some point uh, in the future, Mariana faithful, all the people who are associated with VU. So we've got the two main drivers there, Cale and, and Reed. So last episode of the summer, everybody wants the heat to go away. I thought this would be a really cool topic to think about. How do seasonal changes affect sleep? And so this is going to draw on a lot of things that we've talked about in the past, circadian rhythms and, 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 and uh, school start times to some extent, and uh uh, daylight saving time and all these things kind of to some degree relate to what we're talking about. And we know from these episodes that our sleep behavior is influenced by circadian processes, meaning that our bodies are aligned on a 24 hour schedule to be intrinsically able to set that sort of 24 hour pacemaker in our body, but also use cues from the environment to help that pacemaker adjust and fine tune itself. And so these internal timekeeping cells that we have in our body, these clock cells that we talked about in our circadian uh, episode, sort of synchronize with our environment through different time cues. And two of those big time cues are light and temperature. And so when you think about seasonal change, I think most people, if you said, hey, as you go from season to season, obviously based upon where you live, what variables are changing? What do you associate with seasonal change? People probably say temperature, first of all, summer's hot, winter's cold, depending on where you are, but also available light. You know, I love the summer, the days are long and you know, there's a lot of light in the evening after work for me to do fun stuff. But the winters, I wake up and it's dark and there's not a lot of light and the sun goes down really early. And if you live in Alaska or Scan Northern Scandinavia, there may not be much of any light during the winter time. So light and temperature are big determinants of season. And if you listen to any of the episodes of this podcast, you know 
they're massive pacemakers when it comes to our sleep quality. So there are significant effects when it comes to time of day of sleep. And so as we start to look at our bedtime, our wake time, the quality of our sleep, the way we feel during the day, there's often strong associations between seasons. And there's a body of research out there that we'll talk about a little bit that sort of highlights these things. And some of that research is sort of prospective research. A lot of it has to do with accumulating information uh, from people and kind of looking at overall patterns. You know, sometimes that sleep score uh, we've talked about on the episodes before where you've got this population of people using sleep tracking data that's being sort of accumulated in the cloud. So we can look at, hey, did you know that people in Phoenix don't seem to sleep quite as long as people who live in Minneapolis. I'm making that up. I mean, but you can look at that sort of citywide data that's coming from this aggregate data that we record on people's, you know, bed and wake times. So what does the research look like when it comes to seasonal changes? Well, the first thing that is often seen when you examine seasonal effects on sleep is that the springtime seems to be largely associated with a later bedtime and earlier wake times, which is really interesting, isn't it? So we're getting ready to move to a place where maybe as a population, maybe you as a sleeper might notice that your bedtime is gradually a little bit later, but you're finding that you're waking up earlier. Now, as we move from spring to summer, we often find that there's a later bedtime as well as a later wake time, which is really interesting that we give summers off to kids, right? Because that's probably where their tendencies to be more phase delayed are at their peak in the summertime. They want to go to bed late and wake up late. So giving them the summer off and maybe the potential to manifest that can be pretty helpful. So uh, if we get more granular looking at some of the data, I found a study that basically said, look, spring on average has about three and a half more hours of day length than winter. And by using that day length number, they were able to find that participants approximately in this study had 25 minutes shorter sleep duration um, in the spring, 25 minute earlier wake time and a two minute earlier bedtime relative to winter. And for summer, the average of 3.5 hours of day length more than winter, they saw approximately a 12 minute shorter sleep duration an 11 minute earlier wake time and, in, and no difference really in bedtimes relative to winter. So what is probably causing these changes from you know, season to season? Well, uh, it is estimated that about 50% of this effect is probably coming from temperature, which is really interesting. And we've talked about determinants of sleep and how light is often portrayed as being king. Bedrooms should be dark, wear your blue blocking glasses, lots of light when you wake up in the morning, get outside, exercise, and light's really important. And light is something that we have some degree of control over. We can dim lights in a bedroom. We can wear a sleeping mask. Temperature is probably just as important in determining sleep quality, maybe more important looking at this data. We sometimes just don't really grasp on to ways that we can manipulate that. And we've talked about, you know, if you're somebody who likes it cold, but your partner likes the bedroom warmer, using things that you could put on your bed to maybe make your bed cooler can be really helpful. I have a thing called a Doc Pro on my bed. Uh, they're not paying me to say that. Um, it is a device that I have on my half of the bed, and I can make my side extremely cold if I choose to do so, which I do. And I really feel like that improves the quality of my sleep tremendously. In this one particular study I was looking at, you know, 49% of this change in sleep characteristics from temperature, only 5% they felt like was due to light changes. And they could rationalize this because when they were looking at the environments these individuals slept in, sure, environmental light may change, but the light you're exposed to at work, the light you're exposed to at home 
And these urban centers largely didn't change that much. What was interesting was, okay, 50% from temperature, 5% from light. What are some other factors that might make a difference in terms of sleep based upon season? They felt like 30% was activity level. And that's really interesting, isn't it? Because what differences do you see between summer and winter? Well, in the winter when it is cold and it gets dark early and it's sleeting, snowing, three inches, three feet of snow outside your door, it can be A, difficult to exercise, B, difficult to get to a place to exercise, and C, I don't know about you, but my motivation to exercise when it is cold and dark and dreary is minimal. I don't, you know, I've got dogs. I'm gonna tell you something. If you have trouble with exercise motivation that is seasonal, get a dog because here's a newsflash. They don't really seem to care too much about the season. It is basically, my dog, you know, they they understand. So like they listen to me. So they're, they're generally with me if I'm talking to a patient. So if you're one of my patients, and you'd like to see, I can take the camera and I could point it down on the ground and you can see two dogs curled up sleeping. Now, yes, they are sleeping, but they're also listening too because they have learned to recognize when I say, okay, well, I'll, we'll follow up in three months and talk about you know these new restless leg therapies we got from Dr. Spector's book. Okay, great to see you. And then they listen for me to take my headphones off and put them down on the table, which I typically don't do between patients. So when they hear goodbye and headphones go down, it's time to go on our run. And again, light, temperature, precipitation, they don't care. They are, they are all into it. So again, my motivation is not great when I put those headphones down. In fact, when it's gross outside, I sit there with the headphones on my head thinking, oh, as soon as I put these down, they're going to pop their little heads up with these eager little eyes ready for their exercise. So let's think more about the seasonal changes that we tend to see in sleep. So looking at aggregates of other studies, there are other changes or trends that we tend to see in research. So number one, total sleep time. People do seem to sleep longer in the winter than they do the summer. Again, if we're thinking about 49% of that variance, and again, for that 49% figure, that was actually specifically for patients in the 50 to 64 age range. I still think it's probably important for all ranges, but just to be uh, scientific about that, that was the age range that they were talking about. So it makes sense that what, what are we seeing in the wintertime? We're seeing individuals sleeping longer in the winter and the summer because the temperatures are much colder. And again, it's darker. REM sleep or our dream sleep. REM sleep seems to be longer in the winter and shorter in the summer. So there's a theme here. Uh, my last name is winter. And so far winter is dominating when it comes to sleep amount. It's dominating when it comes to REM sleep, slow wave sleep or our deep sleep. Slow wave sleep is stable from winter to summer, but does seem to decrease some in the fall. So as we get ready to start autumn in the next few days, there may be a little bit of a decrease in deep sleep. So how would that manifest itself in you or a population? A little bit less feeling of sleep quality. If you're somebody who rates your sleep every day, you know, with a scale of one, to, I tell my patients all the time, wake up in the morning and you can write down and you know how many hours you slept, but give yourself a rating. One is off, you know, zero is awful. One is fair. Two is average, three is good, four is amazing. You know, give yourself between zero to four stars. Do you notice yourself rating your sleep a little bit less um, in the fall? Do you also notice yourself being a little bit more sleepy or a little bit more tired in the in, in the fall? Because we know that deep sleep tends to go along with those feelings of sleepiness or fatigue. Um, and also just overall growth hormone secretion is, is highly linked to, to slow wave sleep. So as we enter into the fall, that will be an interesting thing for us to kind of observe. Wake time tends to be earlier in the spring, like we talked about. Sleep efficiency, how much of the time we spend in bed are we actually sleeping? We think about a sleep efficiency of about 85% as being normal. Sleep efficiency is slightly lower in the summer 
than it is in the winter. Again, low sleep efficiency, not necessarily something that we want. We want a higher efficiency. That's the night where you're like, oh my gosh, I got in bed, head at the pillow, and I don't remember anything until my alarm clock went off. Um, so some other factors that can kind of influence this pattern. So why would this be? We talked about temperature, we talked about light, and we talked um, uh, about exercise. I think seasonal allergies as a physician, I see that a lot that, you know, the, the ragweed in the fall and the pollen in the spring can really affect people, particularly when they sleep, you might be more affected by allergies throughout the day than you're aware. But when you get in on your back, lying down and you can breathe only through one nostril, I, I think that probably plays some role in our sleep um, feelings. Uh, it was interesting. One study mentioned thunder and lightning. You know, so the you know April showers bring May flowers. That the rain, the thunder, the storms, which are probably getting more and more, uh, increasing more and more with global climate changes, could those things be disrupting sleep in some people? I love nothing more than hearing rain hit the metal roof when I sleep. But for some people, that can be distressing. If you have dogs, <laughs> our dogs are kind of uh, oblivious to storms. But there's nothing sadder, in my opinion, than being with a dog during 4th of July or during a thunder and electrical storm where they're like hiding behind the toilet. It's so, so sad. Um, just a real quick plug for our friends at Z-Den. Remember that little tent that you can put in your upper half if your partner is obnoxiously reading their favorite book or watching some show on TV and you want to sleep, you make that little tent over your bed. Well, Z-Den makes the little, little thing for animals too, which is so cute. So if you've got a little dog that's scared of thunder and they want a little place where they can feel secure, that's not like wedged underneath the sink or behind the toilet, they make these little cozy Z-Dens for pets too. So something to think about. Um, artificial light. So blue light from digital devices impacts sleep. So depending on light levels outside, you may be using more artificial light in your home that could be influencing sleep as well too. Um, so I'll, I'll close this episode. I don't want to go on too long, uh, but there was you know sort of newer research that was suggesting that humans might need more sleep during cold, dark winter months than they do during the summer. So now we get into sort of, is it causal or reactive? You know, is it that... There are elements about these seasons that are making us sleep differently, or is our sleep changing proactively to address a need that we have in that season? And one of the things I think if you listen to this podcast a lot, there is the there are these bi-directional relationships we talk a lot about. I mean, we were just talking about that recently with inflammation, that sleep influences our inflammatory processes in our body, but having a lot of inflammation in our body can influence sleep and make us feel sleepy and tired, like the way we would get sick. So I love a good, love a good bi-directional relationship. And I think that this German study was sort of highlighting that, that maybe it's not the season influencing sleep, but rather our sleep is prepping us for something in that season. And so in this study, they were looking at individuals who lived in cities where artificial light would be affected to interfere with the natural influence of daylight on our sleeping pattern. So they're trying to say, look, sure, there's different light variances during a season, but maybe that's sort of counterbalanced by the fact that we're in a bunch of light anyway. So do you really, I mean, when I used to work in the hospital at night, have you ever like worked in an environment that's kind of isolated from outdoor light? And then it's time to go home and you walk outside and it's really bright or it's pitch black in the middle of the night or it's raining or it's snowed a foot. And it's kind of disorienting at first because you were walking around in the hospital ward or the bowels of the courthouse where you do your research. Or I always think about radiologists. Got some buddies who are radiologists, a couple of patients who are radiologists. I always have a special worry about them. They go down to the little cave and they read the, the, the mammograms all day long. And then they walk outside and their brain must be assaulted by temperature and light for the first time. Like, I had no idea it was nice out or raining out or snowing out or dark or cold. So anyway, so this study is basically saying, look, you know, these 
people might be somewhat isolated, at least from the light. So they were using detailed recordings of about 200 patients who lived in urban settings and suffered from disturbed sleeping patterns and found that even when these individuals were exposed to you know, primarily artificial lights, they experienced seasonal variations in REM sleep, which they directly related to the circadian rhythm. So like we were talking about before, more REM sleep in the winter, less outside the winter. In fact, these participants slept an hour longer in December than they did in June. So again, I was destined for this job, right? Last name, winter, that's the best sleeping season. When's my birthday? It's in December where we sleep an hour longer than those poor, poor people who you know, or, or hanging out in the month of June. No, it's all about winter. It's all about December, right? Rapid eye movement uh, sleep, which was the most active stage of sleep when we dream and our heart rate increases was 30 minutes longer in the winter than during the summer. Um, and they were surprised, you know, the team was looking at all this stuff and, and surprised that there were also seasonal changes Again, when it came to slow wave sleep that we found, and this is the authors said, look, we found specific changes in REM sleep and deep sleep, the two main stages of sleep over the year. And this was completely new. This was a, a researcher, last name Kunz, K-U-N-Z. So uh, really interesting you know, to think about the idea that as we sleep and as we move from season to season, there are some processes happening behind the scenes that might be acting to not only optimize our sleep, but maybe optimizing our health, our immune system, or some sort of preparatory cycle to get us ready for the things that go along in that season. You know, perhaps cold and flu season, you know, sicknesses and illnesses that come along. So do we sleep a lot when we get sick? Uh, from colds and things that happen in the winter time, absolutely. But maybe we're sleeping longer in the winter time to prep us for those things that we're going to be exposed to when our kids come from, from home from school, or we fly on airplanes and forget to wash our hands or, or wear our masks. So, love the idea that this is a two-way street when it comes to seasons and sleep. So that's it. That is the podcast, Done and Dusted, Seasons and Sleep. If you remember nothing else, just remember of all the seasons, winter is king when it comes to sleep. Uh, interact with the show. Tell us, tell us about your varying uh, observations of your own sleep when it comes to season and season. And if you do it, you've got to tell us where you live because that's really important. We have listeners all over the globe so your seasons and our seasons may be very different. You can interact with the show, DR Chris Winter Twitter, DR Chris Winter Instagram, DR Chris Winter TikTok. Follow us on our YouTube channel, like and subscribe to this podcast. Please take the time to write a review. We really care about those reviews. If you want a trucker hat, we still have some left, $25. Just DM me and we'll work out those arrangements. And that's it. Summer's gone. Fall is on the way. How is it going to affect your sleep? We'll find out soon. Until then, sleep well.